Good morning and welcome to all of you. We're going to spend an hour together discussing the future of the internet in uh, different ways and the different problems and the different challenges and the different possibilities that are there. Overcoming digital phobia is the formal title of it. Whether we will stick to that remains to be seen. But we have a panel here, as you can see, we have myself, Carl Bildt, I'm coming from Sweden. I've been a lot of things in politics there over the years, but I've been also doing the last few years sharing a global panel on internet governance issues covering a lot of these particular issues. And here is Mr. Eskar, who is the, we were prime ministerial colleagues. I was Sweden, Eskar was Finland once upon a time, but he's since, ago. long ago, but since then has had a career also in uh, business, in notably in Nokia, um, in Finland. Uh, I, I will start by having one minor comment on, on safety and security uh, or, or privacy aspect, and then I'd like to speak a few words about, about opportunities, because that is uh, extremely important as, as well. All these aspects are I important, but, but I, I think the, 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 the fundamental issue is how to get maximum out of these technologies in the future as well. But one word uh, about uh, privacy. Um, when I was working for Nokia, I was, I was involved in this debate, and, 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 uh, and I, I think that in some way we have to think about privacy not as a factor for all, but we are, as consumers, a bit different. Like we are when we are making deposits. Some people are ready to take higher risk and they expect to have a higher reward. And then there are people who don't accept risk at all, and they have to accept lower return. And, uh, and, and that is something I hope that we can keep in our mind, that there is not maximum security or maximum safety or sec maximum privacy, privacy protection, but you have to balance between these two. Uh, secondly, about opportunities, I, I think it's very important to understand that the Internet and... and uh, and uh, digital uh, technologies are so-called general purpose technologies. So the main benefit is not coming through these technologies themselves, but it is coming when we learn to use them in all traditional sectors, just like with the railways or electricity or, or, or cars earlier. Um, I, I will take one minor example, how difficult it is to, to, to get benefits uh, uh, out of this. Um, it was 2012 when MIT Media Lab uh, launched uh, 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 a study. I think it was made in Ethiopia. And they gave to children uh, uh, pads with a certain teaching or, or learning program without any support. No teachers, no technical support. And after half a year or something like that, these children had learned uh, alphabetic and, uh, and uh, English language basics. But if you look at, I have a smartphone in my pocket, unfortunately it's not, not, not anymore Nokia, but, but uh, anyway, uh, what we are doing with this, uh, this is a bit old uh, story, but uh, maybe three years ago, the US study was uh, launched saying that 46% of time spent with uh, smartphones is used for playing games. 26% 20, uh, uh, social networking, 10% uh, music and other entertainment. So, so the internet of things is not there. We are far away from that. And I, I think this is a major challenge, how to get business and governments work together in a way that we can, we can, we can make that happen. Thank you. I think um, Esk could touch upon some of the developments that are coming. I mean, we, have, we are going from a situation where the internet was essentially, we got to know it as a communication device. We sent the email to each other. And then gradually we started, as Esk was indicating, we are playing, we have music, we have whatever we do. But primarily, and we've gone from the PCs, if you remember those, they did exist, uh, to being on smartphones. But then we are gradually moving into what is called the Internet of Things. That means that the Internet has gone from 
being nothing, to being the most important infrastructure of the world, to being the infrastructure of every other infrastructure and connecting everything and going to what is de facto data-driven economy, data-driven social life, if we jump somewhat ahead. That makes, of course, the security and stability of this particular system probably the most important security challenge facing all of our societies. Because if that is disrupted or endangered, then the very fabric of our society will be in danger in different ways. And this is important to get this sort of philosophy accepted, how important this is. That security and stability of the internet is the security and stability of everything else. And if I might add one other aspect of it, that's the security and stability of the net itself. Then we have the issues that was alluded to by several, the privacy issues that have been very much in the focus of the debate. Different in different countries, somewhat more in Europe than in the US. Um, Asia even less, I would say, for issues that might be cultural or whatever. But I would argue that then we have an upcoming issue that is the integrity of the data. When we are going to be so dependent as individuals, as enterprises, as countries, on the data that is there in the cloud and in the fiber optic cables and in our different devices, we must be absolutely certain that that particular data is correct, that is not by accident changed, or that is tampered with by the one or the other actor in order to influence our behavior. And there we enter also the difficult issue that was alluded to of encryption. What do we do in order to secure our data both from the point of view of the privacy of it, we don't necessarily want everyone to see all of our data, uh, but also because of the integrity of the data. We don't want it to be tampered with. And these issues are not necessarily the same. A friend of mine often makes the comparison that he doesn't really care if someone finds out his blood group uh, that is there on the net. But it becomes somewhat complicated if they change the blood group and if he becomes sick, because then he dies, to be precise. Uh, and those issues need to be taken into account. So what do we do in order to protect our data better, both in terms of us as individuals, because we all have responsibility, as enterprises perhaps, and as societies? And are we sufficiently focused on these issues? Starting reverse order with Esco, to be fair. Uh, I, I think it's a question of architecture. How, how to design the new architecture for, for, for the Internet of Things. Because as you said, when we are moving from entertainment-driven business into real-life-driven uh, businesses, the, the, the importance of uh, security, safety and privacy will become much, much more important because it's not that relevant if somebody knows what kind of music I'm listening to or, mm -hmm. or as you said, some, some, some minor things will be uh, available. But when, when everything, very essential uh, 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 parts of our lives will be, will be integrated into the Internet, then the risks are much, much higher. And then the risks for the whole society as well. If, if, and when energy systems, uh, transportation, logistics, everything will be dependent on, 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 on the Internet. For sure, uh, safety, uh, safety and security requirements are, are totally different. And I don't think that we can solve those problems by using only technological tools. We have to be able to, to create an architecture where human behavior and technological tools will be integrated. Uh, may I add one, one thing? I, I think this uh, uh, reference to, to cars and road traffic is, is very good because because in, 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 in traffic, for example, we didn't have originally speed limits or we didn't use seat belts. We, we have accepted uh, legislation. In the early phase, there was no laws uh, uh, available. So we have created that kind of architecture where, where the, where the, uh, or ecosystem for, for, for driving. But then there is one additional element. I, I have to tell you, I, I met one Russian oligarch, Alexei Mordashev. Uh, you know him very well as well, uh, uh, maybe 10 years ago. And, and, and in Russia, the word trust is not, not that relevant in the debate. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and, and we were driving in the northern Finland uh, by car, and he asked me about trust. Can you explain to me what trust means? Uh, and 
I had only one second time to consider that question. And then I said, you can see this road going to strongly to the right, and you cannot see if there is somebody coming. But you believe that the person who is driving against us or, or, or coming to the opposite direction is having the same understanding of the rules. And that is trust. And I, I think the Internet of Things cannot be based only high level of technological skills and talents and technological infrastructure and capacities or, or skills and talents to use that uh, or rules and regulations which, which are there. But we have to be able to create trust as well. And that is the most difficult thing to be done because, because uh, you cannot order people to trust to each other. But we have to learn that. And, and this is, uh, in my opinion, extremely important and fundamental thing as well. I very much agree with that. That's a very fundamental point. And that is one of the fundamental challenges that we have at the moment. Because what we do see around the world is that trust in the net is declining. Uh, we have sort of ample support in opinion polling data on that. And there are different reasons for that. People suspect that their governments are snooping in on them. They suspect that sort of American companies are using their, not only American by the way, but it tends to be a lot of that, um, are using their information for commercial or other purposes somewhat beyond what they have agreed to. Um, and they suspect foreign governments might be intruding. And they suspect quite a number of different things. The trust is eroding in the net. And that is not good. And, and we also have the fact that when trust erodes, they see threats coming. And, and you can say to exaggerate slightly that we have a choice between an internet of trust or an internet of threats in the years ahead. And, and this is immense important, not only because of the economic significance of the net, but also because of the significance of the net for our societies. I mean, if, if you take the amount of data that's got to be there on the net, we are very soon in a situation where the net widely defines, widely defined, knows more about you than you know yourself. Because you tend to forget. You don't know everything that you did two years ago or three years ago or four years ago. But the net does know what you did two or three or four years ago. And that creates a new quality to the trust issue in society. When the net becomes so important, so pervasive, so dominating, then it's immensely important for the very fabric of society that we trust the nest, that we don't see it as a threat. And here, I think, is an enormous obligation on companies, on states, and on individuals, how we manage this. And whether we have fully understood the magnitude of this particular challenge is, in my view, somewhat debatable. May, may I add something to this, uh, this comment on, on, let's say, how to, to bargain with a with, uh, with, uh, higher level of uh, privacy or, and, and maybe, maybe payment mm. because of that, and then lower level of uh, privacy and benefits without paying anything. Sure. So I, I think this is the, exactly what I meant when I said that this is like a, like a deposit in there. In the bank, mm -hmm. yeah. but uh, in the same way, I think that uh, you you need to have a right to say as well, I will withdraw, I will take my money out, mm -hmm. and and that is, I I think this is today more or less mission impossible, but in some way that kind of that kind of uh, option have to be there as well, uh, uh, otherwise uh, otherwise I think that there is a risk that people who are making decisions. Well, for example, when you are young, you don't know what is your future, what you are doing in the future, and you are risking certain, in a certain way your future life when being too open. And then later on you have to be able to, to, to get back. I don't know how to, ha how to do that, but I, I think we need that option. That's a debate that we are having in Europe on what is called the right to be forgotten. Uh, where there is uh, legal provisions that you have the right to be forgotten. That is that you can go to Google, say, just to name one, and ask that certain things are taken away. Uh, that's very controversial because uh, if, you are, if you have been convicted of a crime, 
you don't want that to be on the net. Well, fine, from your personal point of view. But isn't it something that should be there, the one way or the other? And then we also have the additional problem that that can be done now and is done within a European jurisdiction because you can take it away within European jurisdiction, but it will still be there available to Americans or Asians or Africans or whatever. Immense problems associated with the right to be forgotten. And then there might be a server somewhere where you have it anyhow, where no jurisdiction whatsoever can reach you. And uh, that sort of indicates some of the immense both legal, moral, and social challenges that are ahead of us with the amount of information that's going to be there. I, I fully agree that it is very complicated. But, but what I mean is that yep. if, if and when you your own, yourself are giving out information about, about yourself, then you have to have a, an option to take it back. For sure, in, in the case when you have made some, something which has, uh, let's say, uh, put into the internet, uh, it's, it's much more complicated and it's not that easy. No, and this, of course, invites the issues also of norms. I mean, the norms for individuals, the norms for companies, and the norms for states. Uh, states have an interest in, indeed, an obligation to secure the nation, to uh, see that the law is uphold, to go after terrorists and criminals and bad guys in the sense of the law. And accordingly, an amount of surveillance is unavoidable, and uh, data is often the absolutely critical item that you need in order to take someone to court. But does that give a license to the state to look at everything all the time for everyone? I don't think we would be feeling comfortable with that. And accordingly, we need sort of agreements on uh, how much a state can do in terms of surveillance. That might be different in different societies, but in my opinion, it should be highly regulated in law there should be an oversight that is transparent, and there should be the ability for someone to challenge that. This is slightly easier said than done. Uh, we have had a vigorous debate in different European societies. There has been a vigorous debate in the United States. I remember a couple of years ago when I was here in Korea, it was a huge issue in, in this country uh, where the government wanted to go after your messaging service, and a lot of people were going to another messaging service as a result of that which was also, of course, negative. So here, states need to be more alert to the fact that even if they do need to do something, they need to recognize that the limits are also important for the health of society. And, and that's sort of a problem that I think we've all been grappling with in different dimensions. Yeah, I, I have to take a concrete example. I was working for Nokia, and I, I was executive board member responsible for governmental relations. And... And quite, quite often I was asked what to do when certain practices we had in Europe was illegal in some other markets. How a global company is able to, to operate globally mm -hmm. and to be sure that, uh, that uh, it is not going to have reputational damage or even, even more damage because of uh, behavior which is fully according to the law in some part of the world and against the law in some other parts of the world. And, and that's why that experience uh, uh, gave me good reason to believe that, that business has to be able to create self-regulation as well. So we cannot rely only on governmental regulation or, or some kind of global regulation, but every single company operating uh, in, in this business have to have a code of conduct uh, according to which it operates. And that has to be so strict that when you recognize that now our code of conduct is in conflict with the requirement of the government in certain markets, you have to be able to make very, very difficult business decision to leave the market because, that, because of that conflict. I know that it's a very painful, very difficult decision to be made, but... Uh, this is the only way how we can keep that trust or to create that trust. And uh, uh, to be honest, I, I don't believe that uh, uh, on the short term we can, we can, we can have that kind of uh, self-regulatory system, but we have to be able to work to that direction.
Why are you selling telephones in China? Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> but actually, actually, also in China, uh, in in the case of Nokia, we were confident that we were able to operate in a way which was uh, not in conflict with our our global uh, offering. Nowadays, it's much much more difficult in the smartphone business, but. Uh, Nokia is not anymore in that business, it's uh, networks. We can continue the conversation up here and we'll certainly do it. Uh, but uh, I just want to open up if there are any questions, any remarks from your side. Uh, please, are there microphones available or what? Thank you so much for bringing up so many different aspects of discussion. For this discussion, I think we are all stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And no matter how you slice it, Always the glass is half, tea, half empty and half full. And who should be leading all this effort about what should be doing? You know, these threats and, and opportunities, securities, and, and someone has to do the leading this effort going forward. And any efforts at the government level, what should we be doing? And you mentioned that there's an increasing gap between the speed of the technological change and the speed of the policy formulation. And any thoughts about the effort? Uh, this is not the first time uh, in the, in the modern, during the modern history when we are facing revolutionary technology uh, with uh, certain kind of uncertainty. Uh, and, and, and this is a human, human uh, factor that Technological inventions are taking place faster than our capacity to take benefit from, from those. And that's why I'm, I'm not that much worried about who is going to make the decision, but how to create understanding what's going on, how to create that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, let's say, architecture for, for, for the future. And I, I, I think that must happen in collaboration between, between business and government. Good example, if you want to, to, to understand that, read about the history of railways, especially in America. For example, until railways came, there were local time in different cities in the United States. Time zones are not invented out of the blue, but they were invented to serve uh, 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 nationwide, uh, transnational uh, 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 railway system. Uh, roughly the same kind of things we have to do in order to take benefit from in the Internet of Things. The old society, so social model, uh, even economic model, doesn't work. And that's why we are a bit confused. But I'm quite confident we can, we can overcome this problem as well. And your question was roughly who's responsible for taking this forward. And I would answer you are. Yeah. Not necessarily you personally, but you personally as well. Everyone is. Uh, these issues are so huge that you can't say it's just the government or it's the business or it's someone else. They apply to each one of us. And I think the hour we spent together have indicated the magnitude of the challenges, but also the fundamental importance of a very open public debate about these things, because they are new. And very many of us feel somewhat uncertain what's really going on. We don't really understand the technology which we don't need to understand, by the way, either, but we need to feel confident that the technology work in our interest and that there's a framework that we accept that we can have trust in. And that requires far more of a global, national and local debate than we've had so far. As I said, I've been heading a global commission. I do sort of a slight commercial. You can find the report if you go to the net. It's called ourinternetasoneword.org. You can find it there. And finally... Esco mentioned railroads, I would go even further and say, we are in the transform, the beginning of the end of the industrial society and the beginning of the beginning of the digital age. And it is only natural that that raises quite a number of different new issues. And debates like these are very important when it comes to addressing them, so to build trust in all of the possibilities that are there. Thank you for coming and continue the debate. Thanks. The World Knowledge Forum.